reading some background information about St. Joseph and the art and how he was depicted, and it became clear to me very quickly, we can't just talk about St. Joseph in 15 minutes. <laughs> so, so I added a second picture, and then now all our three main pictures will be about St. Joseph. Uh, and I feel that we could even a, a, do a whole four-week course on St. Joseph. Um, it's so rich, so wonderful, and um, I hope to, to um, be able to um, get you a little bit of a flavor for it. So, um, okay. So um, I think we're ready to go here. And so good evening, everyone. Um, wonderful to see everyone. And I'm Ulrike McGregor. And I welcome you to the co-cathedral of St. John the Evangelist. Tonight, I would like to expand on our reflection on the Annunciation from two weeks ago and devote this entire lecture to St. Joseph, who is intimately connected to our Virgin Mary and to the Christ child. And he is an integrated and important part of the Holy Family. I will start tonight's lecture with a brief overview of St. Joseph's presence in the scripture, and then show us his slow but steady change to being recognized as the true miracle by which God saves the child and his mother, to use Pope Francis's words. And then I would like to mirror this change through his representation in art over the centuries. In this hour, I will only be able to touch upon a few of so many fascinating facets of the life of St. Joseph and the lessons we can learn from him. At the end of the handout, uh, I have included a few books I would recommend, and one is by Father Donald Calloway, uh, Elizabeth Leff, and others for further exploration uh, of this important figure. We will contemplate the life of St. Joseph through analysis of three works of art. The first painting is by the Spanish Baroque painter Francisco Rizzi, depicting the first of St. Joseph's four dreams. The second picture is by one of the founders of the Preophilite Brotherhood, Sir John Ever Millet, with the title Christ in the house of his parents. Our last work of art tonight is the bronze sculpture, St. Joseph with the boy Jesus, by the Marianist brother Joseph Aspel, which we can find in our own gathering space here at St. John's. And I invite you next time you come back to church, um, maybe to have a closer look, because unfortunately we couldn't bring this, the sculpture over here. That would have been even better. <laughs> These three works of art are from the 17th, the 19th, and the 21st century. And they are closely related to the Advent Gospel readings and related quotes in the scripture. In addition, I will refer to the apostolic letter, Patris Corde, with the Father's heart of Pope Francis presented on December the 8th, 2020, on the 150th anniversary of the proclamation of St. Joseph as the patron as the Universal Church. Pope Francis also declared with this letter the beginning of the year of St. Joseph, which was celebrated just last year from December the 8th, 2020 to December the 8th, 2021. Rather little is known about St. Joseph through the Gospels. There are no spoken words recorded of St. Joseph in the entire Bible. The first appearance of St. Joseph is in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, commonly dated around 80 to 90 AD. Each Gospel contains a genealogy of Jesus showing ancestry from King David. The Gospel of Matthew describes Joseph obeying the direction of an angel to take Mary as his wife, 
to flee with his family to Egypt to escape the massacre of the innocents by Herod, and lastly, to settle his family in the village of Nazareth in Galilee. In the Gospel of Luke, Joseph already lives in Nazareth, and Jesus is born in Bethlehem because Joseph and Mary must travel there to be counted in a Roman imperial census. Luke's account makes no mentioning of St. Joseph being visited by angels, the massacre of the innocent, or of a period they spent in Egypt. The last time St. Joseph is a, appears in person in any of the Gospels is in the narrative of the Passover visit to the temple in Jerusalem when Jesus was 12 years old. And this is only found in the Gospel of Luke. In the New Testament, Joseph is never mentioned after Jesus' childhood. There's no mentioning of his death, and Mary is presented by herself in texts and in art, covering the period of the ministry and passion of Jesus. So Joseph initially appears historically to be in the shadows. Formal devotional recognition of Joseph began only around 800, uh, in the year 800 in France, continuing to prominence in the 15th century, reaching an apogee of popularity in the period following the Council of Trent, 1545 to 63 and carrying over into the 17th and 18th century. However, now it seems that a new interest and a new devotion to St. Joseph has been ignited uh, more recently. Therefore, also the, the reference to the books, they're all very recent within the last couple of years even. There's a, a lot of interest in St. Joseph and integrating them, him in the family and the role he played and why he was so important for the, whole, the success of the Holy Family, actually. And it might be surprising to hear that after Mary, the mother of God, no saint is, freak, is mentioned more frequently in the papal magisterium than Joseph. And we celebrate his feast day on March the 19th. With this brief summary in mind, it is of interest to compare how differently St. Joseph is depicted in works of art over the centuries. The earliest reference to St. Joseph in art is in the large Christian mosaic in Rome in the Basilica of Santa Maria Major. These extensive mosaics were completed between 432 and 440 AD. And Joseph is, can be seen in the upper right here, and I took a, a closer image of him. He's young, bearded, and garbed as a Roman of statues, befitting the concert of a queen. Here he is conversing with the angels, announcing Jesus' birth, and holding a rod in his left hand, symbolizing the authority and responsibility he has just been given. From then on, St. Joseph appears only in images of the nativity, likely reflecting his presence in the scripture during that time. Some of the oldest existing images of St. Joseph can be seen among the icons of St. Catherine's monastery in Egypt, Sinai Peninsula. St. Joseph is shown in what for centuries will become his characteristic pose. He sits in the corner of a cave or the room or the space they are in with his chin in hand pondering the great responsibility he has just been given in caring and protecting the Son of God and his Holy Mother. As devotion to Joseph increased in the 16th century, he's depicted in more works of art, particularly in adorations. 
It is in these adorations that we find a new and different symbolic understanding for the place of St. Joseph in a Catholic iconography. Joseph is no longer a consort protector attesting to Christ's Davidic lineage, a man on the periphery caring for the animals, or simply the rightful husband of Mary. In this painting by Botticelli, Joseph appears to take a nap with the Christ child as the Blessed Virgin looks on. However, St. Joseph is imbued with a deeper symbolism. In the dual and juxtaposed images of Mary and Joseph, we see an allusion to the divine and the human nature of the child, lovingly asleep between the two of them. Entering the Baroque art of the 17th century, we encounter more and more depiction of St. Joseph alone with his foster son, and apart from the Virgin Mary. Among the most popular of these works are the paintings of Spanish artists Bartolomeo Esteban Murillo. In a frequent departure from what had become convention of the Italian Renaissance, Murillo often paints a younger, dark-haired Joseph lovingly embracing and interacting with the Christ child. Murillo shows a Joseph adoringly gazing at the babe while Jesus holds a miniature version of Jesus' flowering staff, and we will talk about this in more detail later, thus symbolizing and symbolically linking him through Joseph to the lineage of David. So this brief overview of St. Joseph depiction in art up to the Baroque era is a gateway into our first painting of the evening, which we will be analyzed in great detail and we want to reflect on this. This first painting is The Dream of St. Joseph by Francisco Rizzi, painted around 1665. Francisco Rizzi was a Spanish painter of Italian ancestry. He was born in Madrid and became one of the earliest painters in Spain to adopt the Baroque style. In 1656, he was officially named a painter to the king. It is important to note that devotion to St. Joseph was most intense in Spain and its American colonies, particularly Mexico. St. Joseph appears in the oeuvre of nearly every 17th century Spanish artist, achieving his most profound expression in the hands of such luminaries as El Greco, Murillo, Saraban, and Martinez Montanes. So now, please look at the painting while I read a quote from the Gospel of the fourth Sunday of Advent. I will quote from St. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. For it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. And with this, um, now it's your part again. Um, I would like to invite you to share your thoughts and impressions and your reflection on this work. Um, and I am always here to help you and we can explore this together. So is that another angel on the right side? Mm -hmm. so, so let me walk you through. So we, we see Joseph sleeping down here in the lower right hand corner. And this is an image, an impression of Mary um, with Jesus in her womb. And there is a, a dove, so the Holy Spirit above Mary. And then this is the, the angel. And the angel is holding a light and also um, holding a branch 
with white flowers, which are lilies, which very often are seen in pictures. Uh, we have seen it in the Annunciation, or in traditional Annunciation, you would see it. It's a, a symbol for the purity uh, of the Virgin Mary. But here it also reflects on the purity um, of St. Joseph. So, um, as we kind of come through the centuries, um, I think even though at the very first one, the mosaic, Joseph was depicted younger, but that very quickly shifted. In most paintings that you will look at, if Joseph is depicted, he's usually depicted as an older gentleman, uh, usually gray-haired uh, with a white beard. And this was really a stepping away from it. And I guess um, either argument is valid. So the initial idea was uh, because Mary was so beautiful and so perfect um, to make the argument, how can a man live with her but not have a, a relation with her? And that is obviously very important to us. Um, on the other hand, the argument has been made, um, they were under constant um, threat and um, they were traveling a lot so there was a lot of someone needed to protect the Holy Family and so I think that's when artists kind of thought well he and we don't know and he might have been younger why wouldn't he be younger um, and they could have lived in a loving relationship um, and so we down here, we also see a little bit of the, the flowers, and we will see that through all the paintings. So that's really the symbol of Joseph. Um, he's always depicted holding a staff with flowers on top. Uh, and that refers to um, a, a reading in, in Revelation, uh, in Numbers, uh, that Joseph wasn't just any man to be given uh, to, to Mary. He had been chosen he, and he had been given special grace um, to be able to, to be with Mary. And so there's a, there's a legend um, or a couple of legends that when he came into the house to s visit with Mary uh, and he was holding a staff, it started to bloom. So that's always the association um, in all of the images and works of art I have come across depicting Joseph, you will see that um, the stab with the, with the flower on, on top. So it's really a symbol that um, recognizes Joseph. Uh, I'm a little struck by the image of Joseph. As, you, know, you were saying that a lot of times he's depicted as being older, mm -hmm. not usually uh, quite as young looking, but this is the first time I think I've seen Joseph where he has a really striking resemblance to Jesus. And it's almost like, yeah, I mean, they look really identical. You can really see old Joseph, short hair, mm -hmm. gray hair, uh, but for the first time I've seen something where it's, it's clear that he's Jesus' dad. Uh, based on you know, all the other paintings that we see of the, the Jesus that looks like this. Yeah, and, and that is very, common kind of in the Spanish depiction of um, Joseph and I think they also wanted to make that connection because father and sons even if they're not biologically similar but if 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 one raises a child and spends so much time with the child and we will talk about um, Joseph's teaching and being a teacher for Jesus uh, throughout his life, and I think so that they wanted to kind of depict that resemblance. It almost looks like, I mean, it looks like he has a halo, which I've never seen him with a halo, and, and how Mary and G Jesus are both like have their hands praying over him, but she looks so happy mm -hmm. also, which just strikes me. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then also, so, um, Mary is kind of just a, a distant um, 
image in his dream just to make that connection and then the Holy Spirit with the triangle and the dove um, really to make that clear. And I just kind of point you to something that I thought was always very interesting because the, the, the short sentence from the, the gospel is um, the, the second part basically of the reading. In the first part of the reading, we hear that Joseph is thinking of divorcing Mary. And um, I thought it was very interesting as I was doing my reading, there are, the first thought that comes in one's mind is that Joseph thought she had um, been unfaithful. Um, but I, I personally always thought that doesn't really make sense. I mean, Mary's without sin. She's, she's perfect and she was perfect her whole life. Um, and she, so it never made sense. And so I'm, I did some research and then so it was kind of, there's three theories I believe to be um, potentially, the potential explanation for this. So it's the suspicion theory, which I can think. Uh, but then there's also the perplexity theory where um, since Joseph knew Mary and he knew of how perfect she was, that he was confused. I mean, it, it's a big thing to take in um, and then also to get your head around it. Because at the end of the Joseph, he was human. We still need to um, keep that in mind too. Um, I think it was very overwhelming, um, the news that he heard as well. So it's the, annunci the annunciation to Mary uh, and, and the revelation to him, I think it's kind of very close and it all kind of happens in a very similar period of time. So there are um, great events that are happening. And the third one was, I thought, which is very interesting, it's the reference theory. Um, most likely J Joseph knew through the, uh, the Old Testament, I mean, he was a, a, a well-read a Jew and he, know, he knew the prophecy and he might have just thought he wasn't good enough. He wasn't worth being the protector of the Son of God. And that was why he might have been con contemplating um, just stepping away from, from the marriage. And just kind of a quick side, um, because in, in the olden times, marriage was kind of a two-phase process. Uh, one, uh, a man and wife, they would get engaged and that was, they would actually be married officially, but they wouldn't live together. And then there was a, a certain period of time um, that would go by and then eventually the wife would join the husband. Um, so even when, because when you hear the readings, it, it says, um, don't be afraid to take Mary into your house. Uh, they were already officially married. It was just then the second part hadn't taken place. Um, Would there have been a scandal for him at the time if Mary was pregnant and she wasn't Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And I think that's actually a beautiful point because uh, she, wouldn't have, she wouldn't have made it throughout without Joseph. Uh, because it would have been a scandal, she would have been excluded from society. Uh, yeah, so many, I mean, some might even go as far as that she might have been killed. Um, it was that it just she couldn't exist on her own. Um, that's um, so very true. Um, and. I think also, um, even though he is sleeping, and um, again, in, in the older um, artwork, he's always presented as sleeping, and it might put on a negative connotation, a little bit. But I think we really have to keep in mind, even though he, we, we didn't hear him speak, but he was a man of action. I mean, every time he was asked, by God through an angel to do something, he jumped into action. And he willingly 
and full-heartedly obeyed the will of God. Um, so I think that's quite amazing. So just in terms of time. Um, so with this, I would like to um, move on to our second painting of this evening. And it's Christ in the House of His Parents by Sir John Every Mille, painted in 1849-50. And in, in this painting, we see a further development of the relationship and how it is presented between Joseph and Jesus. It depicts Joseph as a caring father who is also his teacher on earth. Sir John Everett Millet lived from 1829 to 1896. He was an English painter and illustrator who was one of the founders of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, um, another one of them. Uh, we were, he was a child prodigy who, aged 11, became the youngest student to enter the Royal Academy of Art. The Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood was founded in his home in London. Millet became the most famous exponent of the style. In his painting, Christ in the House of His Parents, however, um, generated considerable amount of controversy. His later works, however, were very successful, making Millet one of the wealthiest artists of his day. In 1885, he was created a baron, and in 1896, he was elected president to the Royal Academy, but died shortly after uh, in London. So now um, I would like to look at the painting as I quote Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, and a sentence of Pope Francis' letter. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And then from Pope Francis' letter. Since Joseph was a carpenter, who earned an honest living to provide for his family. From him, Jesus learned the value, the dignity, and the joy of one's own labor. So, what do we see? I think this painting is brimming with symbols that we can explore. Um, if there's two things we always can take home from a pre-Raphaelite painting is their intense realism and all the symbols they try to pack into, into their paintings. Which one is actually Joseph in this? Which one is Joseph in this picture? <laughs> this is Joseph. I know it's very different. So this is John the Baptist. We can see him um, wearing the fur. And so this is Jesus with Mary. Um, we can recognize her through her blue clothing. Um, this is Joseph. Uh, this is uh, Mary's mother, Saint Ian, and this is um, just a helper in the in the workshop in the in the carpenter's shop. So. The, the controversy about the painting very much came because of the realistic depiction of the people of the time when this painting was created. Um, Millet chose people from, from his town and or relatives, and he very much um, wanted to make the point, because if we think about it, it was during the Industrial Revolution, um, and just a very small number of people were fortunately enough to have great gains through the revolution, Industrial Revolution. And a lot of people lived in poverty and were very disadvantaged. And he wanted to create a painting that helped people to find themselves in this work of art. So if we just kind of um, start and let me actually, I took another, I kind of zoomed in. Um, and so here, and it's not very good. Um, 
there's blood on the palm of his hand and blood there's a, a drop of blood on his foot so um, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. So it's okay. so there's a little bit of blood down here and some blood over here. So I think it's very much foreshadowing his crucif crucifixion. And then Joseph is leaning over and holding his hand, um, and I think this is very much. Uh, and kind of just showing, uh, embracing him and trying to, to, to help him through the pain, even though we, we know that he will not be there during his Christ's passion. And so, yeah, this is John the Baptist, and he's carrying a bowl with water. Again, kind of probably um, foreshadowing him becoming um, John the Baptist uh, and baptizing Christ. Um, then there's a kind of a fun detail in the very back here. I don't know if this is a, it's not much better. It's a flock of sheep. <laughs> and supposedly the story goes that Mele actually went to the butcher to, go, to buy a couple of sheep heads that he took home <laughs> so he could be very realistic in, in, in painting these um, heads of the sheep. And again, it's kind of, it's this whole, Christ will be um, leading the flock of us, of the Christians. So it's, um, and then, um, what else do we have? Oh, and so, Joseph is a carpenter and they're working on a door. So a door has a multiple great symbolic references. It's, it's the door to heaven, right? So he's preparing the door for heaven. But it's also the door that um, Jesus will knock on to, to enter to us. Um, there's a, um, uh, a, in the book of Revelation, um, there's the story that Jesus comes to our door and he knocks and he asks of us to let him in. And the door actually does not have a handle on the outside. So it's up to us to open the door and invite Jesus into our house. Um, and then, um, oh yeah, and then we have, there's a ladder, the ladder of, referring to the ladder of Jacob. Um, the ladder leading into heavens or connecting heaven and earth. Um, and then there's a, we have a, a dove, again, probably representing the Holy Spirit, um, looking down on, on everyone. Um, what, what does the significance of this ladder have? Oh, this one? Yeah. I knew, I absolutely knew that someone would ask me about it. <laughs> And I was, and I looked, and I read, and I couldn't really find anything. <laughs> so, and then since we, there's always an explanation. So I was thinking because, as I mentioned before, usually we have some kind of a flower, um, usually white lilies. Maybe Mille decided on a red poppy, um, which kind of maybe the, like the British background poppies are kind of more. Um, but that, that's, that's my interpreta interpretation, so um, it's not backed up by any historians. <laughs> you said the man on the left is unidentified? He's what? He was a helper? He's a helper, yeah. It's, so he's unidentified. It's, it's odd because each figure is significant in scriptures except him. I think, I mean, quite often when we don't really know who someone is and everyone else is known, that it also could be us. Or the, or the painter. Or the painter. So someone kind of looking into the scene or being invited into the scene to participate in it. And what I actually 
thought was really neat, and again, that's more my explanation. There's a lot of wood shavings on the on the ground, and that's to be expected in a carpenter's shop. But I thought a little bit it might be a symbol for the messiness of our lives, isn't it? It's kind of, and we kind of have to step kind of through it, and um, so I thought um, that was something that intrigued me very much. Um, Yeah, I think she's just taking care of him. And then again, they, they wanted to depict the, the Holy Family united um, in the painting. It's interesting because you don't see in those years of Jesus' life are summed up pretty quickly in scripture. You know, he's, there's so much focus on his infancy and then all of a sudden he's a grown man. There's not much really talked about. And, and this strikes me just as, you know, we're, we're told he came, on, came as a man on earth, you know, when he was also Christ. And this just depicts, like, how normal his life was for a period of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I look at that and I'm just like, she got down on her knees and just, she just wanted to give her, her little guy a hug. Yes. And just how, to me, how normal, even though there's foreshadowing, mm -hmm. You don't, you don't see much of that, it, at least that I'm familiar with, depicting the stage of his life. Right. And, you know, oh. as a parent, you can kind of appreciate that, that they had that period with him where they could just have him as their son, and mm -hmm. teach and enjoy, you know, even with what they knew might be coming, how normal the scene looks to be in many ways. Yeah. And I think that's very much, um, so it's called the hidden years, and we don't know much about it, um, because nothing, not, nothing is actually written about it. Um, but I, I agree, I think that's beautiful, and that's, if we keep thinking of Jesus was fully divine and fully human, and I think this is his very much human part of his life before he starts his ministry, and then goes to the passion, um, and then becomes fully divine again. Yeah, but um, I think with the with focusing more on J Joseph, it becomes clear. And I think for us, we also can pull out this more human side um, of the, of their life. Because Joseph was there, exactly, he was there to, to teach him all the little things. Um, even Jesus was divine, but he still, since he chose a human life, he still had to learn everything, um, as everyone else as well. What I find a little odd is that Joseph is bald. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's definitely the next step, isn't it? <laughs> we had him uh, white-haired, dark-haired, and now he's bald. <laughs> so I, I guess it again represents um, all the, the wide variety of how, us human beings, right? We come in all shapes and forms. Um, and the other thing that always makes me scratch my head is when Jesus is depicted as blonde, he was born in the Middle East. He would have not been blonde. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And I think that's the artistic freedom that some of the artists choose. Wanting that uh, Mary and uh, Jesus have reddish, you know, uh, tinge yeah. to their hair. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> Maybe it's make, to make them stand out more from the hair on either side. Just uh, more special. Yeah, and I, I think the, the pre-Raphaelites, um, again, they, they, if you look through their paintings, they love the red hair, particularly with the women, um, and very much their, um, the British entity, and kind of really diving into that. I can see that 
that it would shock some people that he's like this fragile little thing that's like, oh, like we have to bring him water, we have to kiss him, we have to, <laughs> yeah, and it's really cheeky. And yes, yeah. And all the things we just kind of pointed on and, and mentioned, that was the, the big criticism. Um, that he was almost too normal, and he was um, too much a child, and kind of too soft, too weak. Um, in, in the, at the time, it, it wasn't very well received. Um, but I think now, if, as we step away from it, and um, we can acknowledge um, how it is interesting, and it, it's just, shows us a different perspective. And I think that's always very interesting. I have a question uh, about the prefab Raphaelite Brotherhood. Uh -huh. Could you talk more about that in history, seeing as Malay was part of that and was an initiator? Yeah. So, um, yes. Um, we have spoken about the pre-Raphaelites a, a little bit before. It's just kind of like they show up quite often. But um, yes, yeah, so they, they were mostly three artists that came together. So it was Millet, uh, Holmes, and Rossetti. Um, they were young British artists, uh, very talented. And they wanted to step away from the very kind of strict, um, beautified art that was um, mostly appreciated during the Victorian times. And so they kind of stepped away from this and kind of created during that time quite shocking images, not shocking, shocking, but very different. And then they really were interested in, in realism and using ordinary people uh, and depicting them as ordinary people in their paintings. Um, they only lasted for a couple of years um, and then there were other artists that liked the style and they were called associates or friends of the pre-Raphaelites. Um, but they had a great um, influence on, on British art in particular um, in, in furnishings um, and interiors. So. Ooh, we're running out of time. Um, so with this, sorry to kind of rush a little bit tonight since we started a little bit later. Um, so the, our final work of art for this evening is the Bronx sculpture, St. Joseph with the boy Jesus by the Marianist brother, Joseph Aspel. It was installed in the gathering space here of St. John in December, 2008. It is a companion to our sculpture of the Virgin Mary, which is kind of a beautiful juxtaposition here in the chapel. And both of the pieces were sculpted by Brother Joseph. Marinus' brother, Joseph Aspel, grew up in an Irish family in San Francisco. He attended the University of Dayton, where he majored in English with a minor in art. For more than 40 years, he has been creating a wide variety of art in the broad range of media, such as stained glass, painting, furniture, sketching, airbrush, clay, graphic design, and sculpture. In 1987, Brother Joseph was chosen to design the stadium platform, liturgical furnishings, and graphics for the visit of Pope John Paul II to San Francisco. And this is just a brief list of Brother Joseph's wonderful accomplishments and creations. For the sculpture, St. Joseph with the boy Jesus, I would like to quote from the letter of Pope Francis once more. I quote, as the Lord had done with Israel, so Joseph did with Jesus. He taught him to walk taking him by the hand. He was for him a father who raised an infant to his cheeks, bending down to him and feeding him. And with this, um, what is your impression on this? I think it's, it's a further step forward into really, we can see a contemporary version uh, and depiction of St. Joseph 
and design kind of. Um, I think we have walked past it, but I don't know if we have really seen it. Certainly, I have to say, my husband is like, it's bronze? It's like, yeah. <laughs> So we also very often take things for granted, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's there. So, um, and that was also a reason I, I thought it would be nice to start implementing some of our own works of art, which we have plenty of at St. John's. And How did this end up here? Excuse me? How did this sculpture end up here? It, it, was, it was actually, it was a, a, a donation. It was an anonymous donation from one of the parish uh, members. Um, there was also uh, the Virgin Mary joined St. John's in 2003, and then there was always a wish for having um, a sculpture um, complementing her, so of St. Joseph, and I think it kind of fell into the lab of um, St. John's. I mean, so someone um, kind of said, I'm willing to, to give the gift. And then um, they got in touch with the artist again. To kind of... Such a joyful work that Jesus makes. <laughs> yes, isn't it? Yeah. the world. So both that piece and, and the Virgin Mary were designed for this space, as opposed to being it was somewhere else and it was purchased. Correct. So I have to, there's not a lot of available on the website and I have, I have some material. I haven't spoken uh, personally with Father Joseph. Uh, I believe the sculpture exists a couple of times. I mean, at least two, because I've seen another image of it in a different place. Uh, but it wasn't that it was there and it was bought. It was in conversation with him and because he, um, he actually submitted some other images for a potentially making a different type of a sculpture uh, and then it was decided on this. So it wasn't somewhere else and then bought for, it was kind of made but with the, in, with the idea in mind already. So it, he, I, don't, I believe he, he didn't come here and say, okay, what can I, how can I implement this? So I think it's a it's more the correct word is probably a limited edition. As I say, I, I know certainly for, of one other that I had seen and that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm struck by how large the child's hands are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Yeah, quite often in sculptures, um, we had looked last in during Lent, we had looked at the Pieta, and again, the the proportions are often a little bit off in a sculpture to at the end of the day make it work. Um, if you if you really focus on it, you notice the discordance in the, in the proportions, but it's, if you look at it as a whole, it it actually usually works, and there's uh, certain reasons. Quite often, sculptures have rather big feet. Um, if you think of David, but it's just because you have to anchor the, the whole sculpture um, somewhere. So, yeah. I think going along with that, uh, it's always been one of my favorite or depictions of Joseph because he looks like a worker. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not only are Jesus' hands big, but Joseph's calves are the size of my, my yeah. whole body. Yeah. <laughs> and it, remind, it reminds me that he was a craftsman. Is tecton, that this is something that has been in his family for generations. So his, his physical size and, and you know the veins in his arms, the size yes. of his forearms, yeah, very much a, yeah. uh, a sign that his family has been doing this for like he's built for this, right? Mm -hmm. and Jesus the same way, this monstrosity of his hands and his his legs, um, yeah. all point to that kind of history of work. Yeah, and I think it very much also um, reflects Joseph was a father, and he loved being a father, and he took took it all in a stride, and he really was um, a loving father. He was an obey an obedient father, right? He 
obeyed the requests of God. And, and, um, and, there is a, and these are kind of um, sub-headlines in uh, um, Pope Francis' letter, which is also marvelous to read, I mean, if you, if you get the time. And then so one was uh, a cre creatively courageous father. And that was definitely something that I absolutely loved. And um, we obviously, when we think father, we might think of our own fathers. Um, and that definitely was something that would describe my, my dad. My dad, we, I grew up on a farm and my dad, I mean, that would be him. I mean, he had massive hands and so, um, but he was also, as he, he was a working father. He was a father in the shadows, as we, as we said earlier. He, he wasn't um, going out there and, and preaching or doing anything to change the world in an in a, in a, um, active way for him, but he was still active to support his family. And I think that really um, is something why St. Joseph um, is very much, uh, or people start devotion to him more and more again because there is a great need of fathers. Um, we all need fathers. Unfortunately, I looked up the statistics actually, one in four families are without a father. And there's a, a whole list of rather negative impact that can happen to children if they grow up without a father. Not necessarily, of course. Um, but it, I think we, people are desperate to have fathers in their lives again. Um, and for them, fathers to be okay with taking the responsibility. It was earlier with the hidden years. Uh, even Joseph was probably the one who was leading his family in prayer, right? Um, although maybe Mary might have had more insights, or certainly as Jesus was growing up, he was given the wisdom by God. But surely, I think, St. Joseph was the one who was leading them. And I think this is important too, is um, giving fathers the opportunity to, to lead their families and kind of um, bring us together as families. So... Um, I think the look on Joseph's face and the fact that Jesus is on his shoulders is, yeah, I have, he has this responsibility, but for him it doesn't look like a burden, it's a joy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's beautiful. Well, yeah. I think too, he strikes me always because he is so quiet and unassuming. And in our in our world these days, I meditate a lot on how what gets attention is what's violent and striking and shocking. And that's what gets all the media attention and everyone gets caught up in it. But there is a lot of quiet goodness that exists in the world. And I, for one, feel that the more we can point that out to other people in any way we can, that most people are inherently good because we're you know, created by God. And in any way you can, especially, you know, with younger co-workers. And it's so easy to get caught up in the headline you heard today that's so negative or, you know, the comments that people love to read on anything that's posted. And I don't even know what that platform's are. But, <laughs> but there is so much quiet goodness. And that's what I hope will prevail in some of our big trials right now. But you, but you have to look for it and you have to focus on it and make sure that everyone realizes that and tries to turn their perspective around. Mm -hmm. And I think that was also very much um, Pope Francis' intention to bring um, the focus back on the every the normal, the, the, the hidden jams in our lives. And you mentioned COVID. Um, things were bad, but they still were okay because we had a lot of quiet, um, obedient, and, and, and dignity people that just went on with what needed to be done. And they weren't in the newspapers. 
Um, but it just did it because it was the right thing to do. Uh, so I think that was very much also uh, Pope Francis's intention. So I, the time is up. I just want to make you, I don't want to keep you. Thank you very much for coming. I think um, you enjoyed tonight's um, lecture. So. Uh, I, I felt welcomed. Oh, okay. But the more I look at it, he's looking at it.